You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Hey, welcome along to a brand new Straight to Video Podcast. As always with me, Rob Lane. Hope you're all doing great out there. Today, I've got a special treat for you as I welcome Hollywood screenwriter Rich Wilkes to the show. Rich was first brought to my attention by fellow podcaster and all-round awesome dude Chuck Shute, who had Rich on his podcast, and it was at that point I realized how much of Rich's body of work I was familiar with. Rich was the guy who came up with the idea and wrote the story of the 1994 hard rock movie Airheads, starring Brendan Fraser, Steve Buscemi and Adam Sandler, a film that boasts an incredible cast, an amazing soundtrack and over 25 years later has a worldwide cult following. Following Airheads, Rich would work on the movie Billy Madison, the big screen adaptation of The Jerky Boys. He would be the mastermind and creator of the huge Vin Diesel vehicle and franchise Triple X, and he would also be the original scriptwriter of the Motley Crue biopic The Dirt, which he began working on way back in 2002. It was like that film was never going to see the light of day until it finally surfaced on Netflix a couple of years ago. What really piqued my interest though during Chuck's conversation with Rich, which you all need to check out over on the Chuck Shoot podcast along with all the other great chats to be found there, it was the documentary Punk Like Me which followed Rich and his band Carne Asada as they blagged themselves a spot on the Warp Tour which allowed Rich and his mates to live out their rock and roll dreams of touring when they were well into their 30s and realising that perhaps it wasn't all they thought it would be once you've got adult responsibilities. I urge all my band friends and just anyone who loves rock and roll documentary to check this out on amazon prime because it's just wonderful and one of the most original music docs i have seen before we get into my chat with rich please show some love to our friends dead skull coffee who are offering all listeners to this show 15 percent off their ground or full bean coffee simply head on over to deadskullcoffee.co.uk and when you've filled your shopping cart just add stv as the promo code and you'll get that sweet discount And also thank you to everyone over on the Straight to Video Patreon page, including our newest patrons, Joey Strange and Rob Marchant. Really appreciate the support and belief in this show and having you on board really makes a difference. The Straight to Video Patreon allows you behind the scenes access to the show, early info on guests, a bonus podcast episode, along with exclusive merch you can't get anywhere else. All the info can be found at patreon.com forward slash stvpod and thank you for even considering to check it out. All right, Rich Wilkes was an absolute joy to chat to. There's so much more I wanted to dive into, but I think we got some great stuff in this chat which you're going to enjoy. Please make sure to check out Punk Like Me on Amazon Prime and you can also find Carne Asada Music and Merch on Bandcamp. So if you like the sound of perhaps the world's one and only punk rock mariachi band, then please pay them a visit. But in the meantime, please enjoy my straight-to-video chat with movie screenwriter Rich Wilkes. We're not a real band. We'll maybe never be. Fuck that. For one thing's for sure, we won't waste this opportunity. (laughs) We're gonna play hard. We'll jump up our goal. We'll go running for the doors First we rock it Then we kick it Then we play it real fast Till our pencil down our ass Then we roll it We control it And you'll never suspect We're all college graduates Cause wouldn't it make you sick to understand We're not a real fan How are you sir? You alright? I'm doing great man How are you doing? Yeah I'm good Impressive Boba Fett helmet in the background Sharing some Star Wars Yeah I'm checking out your, your background <laughs> See what I can spot. Got 1984. First one every time. That's what people get. Yeah. Wow. Nice guitar too. Oh, yeah. I don't know how familiar you are with um, Beatles history, but I'm a big fan of uh, Stuart Sutcliffe, the original, original bass player. Mm -hmm. Backbeat's one of my all-time favorite films. So I thought, I want to get a guitar like Stuart's. Even though he's not known for his bass playing, I think he's the coolest guy on the planet. (laughs) I did love that movie. Uh, I heard they made a stage play out of it or something. Yeah, saw that too in London. It was great. It's really, really cool. A live band as well. They must have got the rights from the Beatles to use the music then. I guess so. I don't know what the deal is behind all that because um, I heard like stories that Paul McCartney didn't like the film. 
I don't know. I don't know how it works because it's kind of the songs in um, Backbeat are kind of pre-Beatles, the kind of rock and roll standards. OK, so, yeah, they, they don't need permit because I do remember it was like uh, it was all that early stuff that was not original composition. So that's what I remember because it was in Germany and whatnot. Yeah, it's the coolest. It really is. How are you for time, Rich? I don't want to. Oh, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. I love chatting. So whatever, whatever you have in mind, whatever, whatever you run out of questions. Okay. Uh, well, first off, shout to um, my friend Chuck Shu. Saw your interview with him on his show, and that was a great chat. It was kind of what put us in contact. Chuck's awesome. I don't want to try and tread on all his toes and cover all the same stuff, but there's a few things which I know my listeners will enjoy. So if I skew the timeline a bit and bounce around, rein me in. But I appreciate you taking some time to do this. Um, of course. Forward to hearing some stories. You and your family, you're originally from New Jersey, um, but when did your family actually move to the West Coast? Was you still pretty young? We first moved to uh, Geneva, Switzerland for three years, third, fourth, fifth grade for me, and then showed up in Southern California in sixth grade, which is, I guess, about 10 years old. Right. Uh, and I've been in Southern California since then. That's a lot of moving around at such a young age when you kind of forming your friendships and all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So it, it put me a few years behind because, you know, socially people in, in Switzerland at that time were a little bit behind the U.S. as far as, yeah, I don't know, just everything was a little bit... Like I taught English in Taiwan for a little while and socially at the age of 19, they are in America what we are in sixth grade. You know, they just very, very conservative and small, uh, you know, I'm sure things have changed since I was there, but still, it, yeah, I, I showed up in sixth grade with sort of the mentality of a third grader and was way behind in what everyone else was interested in. Yeah. How did that play out at school? Did you get bullied at all? Kids can be pretty ruthless at that age. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I found a good group of nerdy kids to hang out with. So we were strength in numbers. Yeah, we were all the smart kids. So we got to put in special classes for smart people where there's less supervision, you get to screw around more. I don't know how, how it works overseas, but that's the way it is here. Very cool. And where was it you moved to in California? Was it Oceanside? Yeah, Oceanside is down by San Diego. It's right next to the Marine Corps base, Camp Pendleton, which is this massive, massive, huge Marine Corps facility. So half of the kids in my school were, were Marine Corps kids or military kids. There's a show that they shoot there called Animal Kingdom. You know, when I was growing up there, it was, it was fairly rough and tumble. Not that I was getting in fist fights, but it's changed a lot lately. But uh, like football players like Junior Seau came from, from Oceanside and just a badass Samoan family that lived there. They're just like really, really great athletes. There were some really, really interesting folks in that, uh, in that Marine Corps mix. What was your first impressions of California? He obviously was born in New Jersey, so um, you had a bit of pop culture, then moving to Switzerland, then coming back. Was you kind of catching up on all the films and TV shows and everything which was happening? Yeah, that's right. Like I showed up and, you know, people were watching a show called Happy Days with Fonzie on it, which I had not heard of. And that was, you know, really cool. And everyone sort of acted like the kids in the Bad News Bears, the first Bad News Bears movie. You know, they were smart mouth. They had long hair. They were they were just cool. They paid attention to how they combed their hair and shit. And that was all foreign to me, literally from Switzerland. So it was it was a bit of a, a, a culture shock. But uh, you get you get used to it pretty quick. What were some of the first things you kind of gravitated to in California? Was was film something that always attracted you or was music something that's always been a massive part? It was mostly m movies, I got to say, because we had prior to HBO, there was something called Cable Theater Club and you'd sign up and you get six movies a month and they would just play those six movies over and over and over. So it would be Taxi Driver, it would be Black Sunday, it would be Jaws, whatever. And you're a kid. And so you watch it endlessly. And because my neighborhood was new and we were out away from everybody else, you know, there wasn't that many people to hang out with except for the kids on my street. And so I wound up watching a lot of movies at home. And that's sort of what got me into it, I think. You know, you see bad movies when you're you're 10 years old and you remember them so fondly. You go back and look at it. They're not the greatest movies, but they still have that stuff in there that got you from the beginning. You know, like there's this great uh, Jan Michael Vincent movie, uh, Damnation Alley. Uh, it's a post-apocalyptic world. And they built this crazy six-wheeled truck for the movie. And the it's hard to describe. You'd have to see the trailer. But it's just the most ridiculous movie with with killer cockroaches and stuff. And Oh, uh, wow. But I'd seen it so many times having it on that cable channel that uh, I just looked it up this weekend on YouTube. And it brings back memories. It's like the worst special effects, but the greatest memories I have of that movie. You had one of the most handsome movie stars of all time in that film. He could carry anything. <laughs> exactly. And I think you said Motley Crue, one of your favorite bands. Like, was it during high school they were 
were kind of your band. That's right. Yeah, right when their first uh, album came out, actually, the the they released it themselves on Leather Records, the Too Fast for Love, and then they got a record deal and and put it out with whoever it was, Electra. But prior to that, uh, one of my buddies had got that Leather Records album, and we were getting into it in you know whatever it was, eighty two, eighty three. I guess it was eighty three. From the beginning, that was like our, you know, that was our band for those years. And it was, you know, it was such an amazing experience to get to work with those guys 20 years later to do their biopic. I guess it was more than 20 years later once the movie got made. That's like a proper full circle pinch me thing. Yeah, yeah. I got to write the Motley Crue biopic, The Dirt, for Netflix based on the on their book. And I had read the book and that was like early 2000s, fell in love with it, got the job. The movie took 17 years to get made. So... During that time, at least I got to hang out with Tommy and meet, you know, go see the band rehearsing for their concert tour and setting up the whole gigantic stage in a small place and then, you know, running all the pyrotechnics and all that crap. So it was a lot of fun. But a lot of the times you get to do stuff like that later in life and you're like, well, do I really want to go and do this? Well, yeah, my 16 year old self would kick my ass if you know you had the opportunity to go see Motley Crue do a sound check and you didn't go. So I wound up seeing them six times on that tour uh, up in Sacramento and, and down here in L.A. and all over the place just because you have to, you know, you can't not do it. Was that when they first got back together for the Carnival of Sins tour? Yes, it was. It was uh they came up with this logo, I think it's on, a, let me grab this shirt, called the Better Live Than Dead Tour, the Red, White and Crew Tour, 2005. That's the one which they announced before they'd even got the band back together, right? It's a pretty cool like MTV documentary about that, I think, or VH1. I was working on the movie with them and, the, and their manager said, well, can you come up with a name for the tour? And so I jokingly said, well, Better Live Than Dead. And he was like, no, that's terrible. They'll never go for that. That's so dark. Because, you know, Mick was on death's door for a mm-hmm. while. But then they turned out to use it. I never, I never heard back after I suggested that title until I saw it on a T-shirt. And I'm like, oh, okay. I guess they went with that. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, was you a fan of any other bands from that era? Because I know you later dived into punk rock, but was any other hard rock bands a big deal for you, being in California and that whole scene kicking off? Yeah, Van Halen was, was a huge one. I saw the 1984 tour, like you have on your wall back there. We liked all of those, you know, the Judas Priest, Scorpions, Iron Maiden, sort of early 80s metal, the sort of stuff pre the hair bands and pre the Metallicas. It was sort of that, that hard rock spot, you know, that I guess Guns N' Roses took over. But uh, yeah, we loved to see, we would go see those guys, those kinds of bands on tour. We saw Motley Crue when they were doing their first headlining thing in like a 3,000 person theater, if it was even that. Got to see the Ramones back in like '83. Yeah, I squeezed in, I squeezed in as many shows as I could get away with. Was this in like the San Diego area, or did you travel up to Hollywood? No, no, I never traveled to Hollywood. It was all San Diego until college times. But uh, yeah, everybody who would come on tour would come to San Diego because it's right next to LA, and it's not that much of a drive, and you get a whole new market. Did you have a bunch of buddies who you all went to the shows with together? It was a very stereotypical Fast Times at Ridgemont High. We got the van, we got a trash can loaded with beer. We're driving down to the parking lot of the of the sports arena to hang out there and then you know we'd have this other group of friends that would manage to scam their way backstage at the crew show to get and meet the guys which was fucking awesome you know and the security guards are chasing them and they run up to nikki go nikki nikki they're gonna throw us out yeah leave these guys they're cool come on back and have a beer with them just a fucking legendary story you know that is such a cool rock star move you made a fan for life awesome i love that kind of stuff and uh, you mentioned van halen and david lee roth gets quite a few name checks in your punk like me movie oh yeah did you ever try and contact him to do a voiceover for the character in the film no, but I, I tried afterwards, just during the pandemic, because a buddy of mine did some filming with him for, you know, the backdrop to a, one of his concerts, uh, you know, when they show video of whatever. It was him with his dogs. He has these hunting dogs. And so my buddy produced the shoot where they went out and shot all the hunting dogs. And so I got in touch with him and said, you know, let's let's try to hook up with Dave and see what's going on. See if he wants to, if he's got a project that he's interested in, if he's got a documentary or if he wants to act or whatever. And uh, went through his guys and spoke to his guys. And we were reaching out right at the time when his favorite dog had just died, uh, which was not a great time. But he's insanely busy. He's insane, I guess. Is I mean, if you hear him on podcasts and stuff, you just can't get him to... He's hilarious, but he's a motor mouth. He makes radical connections within his head that are hard to follow. But I think he's fucking brilliant. 
uh, and I would love to do anything with that guy. Because you use, I think it's the song, it's Showtime in Punk Like Me. Yeah, yeah. Which is from A Little Ain't Enough. I love that album. It doesn't get enough love, that album, does it? No, absolutely. Absolutely. And and even the, the DLR band album with Slam Dunka as the opener. Uh, yeah, he's fantastic. I, I actually had tickets to go see him in Vegas the 20th of March. And then in the U.S. lockdown was the 13th of March. Missed it. Dang it. I'm interested. When did you start writing for fanzines? I'm a big fanzine fan. Was that in high school or once you start getting into punk rock? Because that's always been associated with that style of music. In high school, we did a, a parody of the school newspaper. Our school newspaper was The Sun and we did one called The Scum. And we got in trouble for it and almost didn't get to go through graduation. And then after <laughs> uh, high school, I went to uh, Santa Cruz for college and I started doing zines after that because it was a good way to get to talk to bands and get to go see bands for free. If you could say, hey, I'm writing for the San Diego Union Tribune or whatever. So I would do that. I would call up the little record company and you know, I saw that the Circle Jerks are coming to town. So I'd call them and say, hey, I'm going to write for this newspaper can I get backstage or whatever? And so I'd go to Tijuana to see the Circle Jerks and then go backstage and take pictures and chat with them and write it up for the newspaper. So I got to do that with a with a handful of bands that I love. I love Jello Biafra from Dead Kennedys and the Dead Milkmen and Pandoras and, and you know, Chili Peppers and just had an amazing time doing it. And that sort of led to doing comedic stuff, writing funny articles for the zines which led to me, you know, out of nowhere, I decided, well, you know, I like Charles Bukowski. Why don't I write to Charles Bukowski, see if I can get him to send us some poetry? Because he used to do that back in the day. And he, you know, he sent in stuff. Like, he shockingly sent in original poetry. Wow. And he was a contributor for over a year. And he was like my pen pal. I would write to him, thank you so much for the whatever. And he'd write back and put these little, you know, he does these little doodles and sketches of himself at the bottom. And it'll say, dear Rich, blah, 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 blah. And then I'll have a, a draw of him drinking a beer, laying on the couch, smoking a cigarette. And they're so good. And I got him to do uh, record reviews. I did it. I had him to do a record review of uh, No Effects Green Corn, the song Green Corn on White Trash album or on Ribbed album. And of the Chili Peppers, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, they have a song about uh, Mellow Ships, Linky and B Major. And so anyway, both of these songs had lyrics about Bukowski. So I sent him a cassette. Can you do a music review of these these uh, songs that mention you? And the, the review was, you know, my wife turned on the music really loud and I said, hey, hey, what the fuck? End of review. <laughs> It was so brilliant. That's what got me, you know, I sent that to uh, Fat Mike from No Effects, and that's how I became involved with him over the years, because it's just such a random thing. You know, he's like, fuck, you got Bukowski to review my record? That's hilarious. And it's just always fun to do that. Like, you reach out to somebody like that you admire, and they respond. Most of the time, they don't, but what the hell? He did. Tell me you've still got all those letters and doodles and stuff like that. Yeah, I got them in a fireproof box. I have at least 20 poems of his is that he said had, he had sent only to me because he didn't like the double. He was, he, he was very specific about if you're not going to, if it's not good enough and you don't want to publish it, let me know. I'll send it to somewhere else. I don't want to double it up. Like I would, you know, we'd publish anything that he sent us. So we published every single one and they could be exclusives for all I know. I mean, he was very prolific. I haven't seen him in books. So maybe one day they'll, uh, they'll be worth something. I don't know. They gotta be. That's like, that's insane. Was um, Bukowski an influence on you from like a writing point of view? Because didn't you originally want to study as a writer and novelist before I didn't into screenwriting? Yeah, you know, from my era, it was we were always into Bukowski and Hunter Thompson and, you know, Confederacy of Dunces and, you know, Vonnegut. There were certain people that we all loved and that, that wound up influencing whatever you do, I think. You know, Hunter Thompson is sort of just so ubiquitous that everybody's voice is sort of affected by him. And Bukowski as well. There's there's certain people that are just in your brain from a young, you know, it's like being a movie fan. Star Wars is in there, whether you acknowledge it or not. Star Wars and Pulp Fiction are going to come through in whatever you do. Uh, and it's the same with writing, you know, with those guys or with the Ramones or or what have you. So, yeah, I really did. I still want to be, I would love to be a novelist. I love the whole idea of what Tarantino is doing now. I just started his book, you know, and his idea that once I'm done with movies, I'm going to retire and write novels. 
And like, that's fucking brilliant. You know, you could do that uh, on the comfort of your own front porch. And, uh, you know, he's still going to change the world no matter what he does. So when did the transition happen from wanting to be a novelist to becoming a screenwriter in the film industry? I had a, a writing teacher the first semester I was at college and I and he was a novelist, like, you know, a fancy, you know, not like a, he didn't know who, who Stephen King was. He's not a guy who, who looked at the charts. And so I asked him, well, you know, if I want to be a writer, what is the job market like? You know, is this a good time for me to try to be a novelist? And he said, and this was heartbreaking and genius at the same time. It's like those who are driven to write should write. And those who are not driven to write should probably leave it alone. In other words, if you're getting into it as a job and you think it might make a cool career, forget about it. You're only doing it because you have no other choice than to do it. Well, that's the way I felt. I, I felt like I had no other choice. I, I'd be writing, doing whatever, but there really is no future in novel writing. It's a world that is so fucking impenetrable to me. And I happened to meet people that whose parents worked in the film industry, and suddenly that seemed real. Like, okay, you could write a screenplay and get it to people and, you know, it's possible. I still don't know how the world of novels works, except for self-publishing on, on Amazon. I'd love to be able to do it. You know, you're a lot less dependent on other people, but still you want people to read whatever you write and you put it on Amazon, it gets lost. So what's the, what's the point? So yeah, I, I, the segue to, to film was probably because of that. I always thought of novels as being so much more prestigious and smart than movies, but then you see movies that blow your mind, you know, intellectually, artistically, visually, whatever. It's not the lesser medium. And, and there was a shift in the 80s, I think, when in the 60s and 70s, everybody wanted to write the great American novel. And then everyone wanted to write the great American movie. And I don't know what it is now, but it's that sort of the dream. I don't know if there's a comparable anymore, like an album or a whatever. But yeah, the draw was definitely for that, for writing novels. But screenplays, there's a lot fewer words on the page. That's true. You don't have to do as much. <laughs> <laughs> you moved to Oceanside, but you went to um, university in Santa Cruz. Yeah. When did you first venture into um, Hollywood? I would come down to be on game shows and to be an extra and stuff. So I was an extra in, in several low budget movies and on a TV show. And then I was on the dating game game show and I tried out for Wheel of Fortune and everything yeah. just to see what's going on. And then I went to American Film Institute in Hollywood. This was after I had spent a little time making TV commercials, not like real TV commercials, but you know, my friend's dad was a, a, an attorney. So we would make, you know, for his law firm down in Florida, we would make, it wasn't like real, you know, ad agency kind of stuff, but uh, just getting whatever experience I could. And then finally just moved to LA when I got into the American Film Institute. And that's when it even seems more real because everybody there was, you know, knows, you know, somebody or works at the agency part-time or as a production assistant or whatever. Yeah, it got to be really, really exciting. You mentioned some bit parts and you was in Santa Cruz. Was that when you did the Lost Boys thing? Because you had an extra part in that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I did. Uh, I was in the Lost Boys uh, on the pier uh, as an extra. I had submitted a photo for a speaking role and I didn't hear back. So I went home for the summer. And then as soon as I got home, I got the call. Hey, they called for you to come in for an audition for a speaking role. And I said, uh, I'm never going to get it. So I'm not going to drive six hours back to Santa Cruz to, you know, do a stupid audition, which I probably should have. It would have been a better story. But I can't even see myself in that movie. But the other one that I can see myself in is the Dead Pit, a zombie movie from the 80s set in a mental institution. So I got to be a, a mental patient who turns into a zombie. So I was there for, I don't know how many days of shooting but i got to have the zombie makeup and i got to be in a large pack of zombies charging towards the camera all backlit and of course as a dumb kid extra you want to make sure you're seen so i would fall down and then get up and just anything to draw attention to myself like an awesome idiot. which bit of lost boys is it on the pier is it the concert scene i think it's it's the same night but they weren't shooting the concert that night it's when the yeah the, the boys first show up down there to the pier and it's the same scene but the band wasn't playing that night at the same time we were doing that they were filming the lost boys themselves on the motorcycles they're riding on the beach they were being towed up and down by a tow rig while we were shooting on the on the boardwalk that was really exciting was you playing in bands during all this time when did you start becoming a drummer was that when you got into punk rock you thought right i'm going to give this a shot as a musician yeah exactly it's a lot easier to be in a punk rock band than it is to be in a van halen cover band right you have to know what you're doing and i always love the ramones for that you know 
it doesn't have to be brilliant to be great. You don't have to be proficient to be a, a genius. So uh, starting in high school or in college, we started doing that. Yeah. Messing around playing drums and, you know, playing parties and, and whatnot. and just had a blast. And it was perfect because 86, 87, punk rock was dead. Everybody gave up on it. And even Bad Religion put out like a heavy metal album and the Vandals put out a country album and the suicidal tendencies, they switched over to speed metal. I mean, everything was dead. The only guys that were around were the Circle Jerks, the Dickies, uh, Bad Brains, a few bands like that. And so it was, funnily enough, it was uncool again. Right. You know what I mean? It wasn't like a trendy thing. So we were like, all right, fuck it. We're going to play, you know, Circle Jerks cover songs and whatever. And it, it really was a perfect time to, to be doing that. We didn't feel like we were bandwagon guys. And if we'd stuck to it, maybe we could have been on the early war. <laughs> so if I get this right, you're at university and submitted a script to, was it Touchstone? And they optioned and yeah. offered you some money to, was it to develop the script? So you chose to do that instead of studying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I wrote a script the first year of American Film Institute. It's a two-year program. The first year I wrote a script and submitted to a fellowship. Disney, it was a Touchstone fellowship, just meaning that they were going to, they were looking for multicultural, they wanted to diversify and, and, and get some different voices in. So they had this multicultural uh, fellowship. And I just see that as an opportunity when you have an opportunity, like when they say, enter this contest by sending your script to this address, I don't care the details of the contest. I send my thing in with a funny cover letter. I know I'm not qualified for your thing, but hey, I got you to read my letter. So why don't you read my script? It was like your contact. It's like trying to find that elusive email or that address and stuff like that. Exactly. And then you slide in there and they found my cover letter amusing enough to read the script. And it was, you know, not for the fellowship, but they they optioned it to try to make a movie out of it. So I, I quit school and worked on that for a couple of years at Touchstone. I had two movies there. They both wound up not going, but I got the rights back to them and we wound up making them a couple of years later. But from then, I mean, it was so easy to get into the movie business back then because they were, let me back that up. It was easy to make a living back then. Once you were in as a writer, they were developing stuff constantly. So if you would come in and say, hey, I got this idea about, you know, these guys go on a hot air balloon, you know, and it goes back in time and they're like, OK, well, great, go write it. Way before the time of remake, everything was a remake and all that kind of thing. Yeah, way before then. People was up for new, fresh ideas. Correct. Their philosophy was, we'll buy all of these ideas. I'm not going to pay a ton of money, but go write the script. Great. Maybe something great will come out of it. And that worked for a couple of years so that I would have friends that I would have five movies in development at once because you could go in with something as simple as a rock and roll band takes the radio station hostage to get their record played. Oh, OK, fuck. So I had an agent and then I, I had met a few producers from whatever, but like it was back in the day out of nowhere after I got my first couple of things set up, Ron Howard called me. He cold called me. And, you know, the secretary said, Ron Howard's on the phone for you. I'm like, OK. And he, he says, hey, so I hear you're the, the guy to talk to about comedy in this town. And I'm like, OK. You know, I wound up trying to work with them for a while. We worked on a thing and I, and, and I figured this was just what happens, you know. You, you sell something and then Ron Howard calls you and it's the, you know, the pro forma dumb call and, and you know, just to try to, I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. But it came so easy that it seemed like, all right, so Ron Howard called. They must call everybody. I just assumed that they called everybody because that's what you do. I don't know why. So anyway, you, you sell a bunch of stuff. They didn't wind up making any of those movies during that era. And then they decided, well, why are we wasting all of this money paying writers to write scripts? They come in with an idea. We pay them to write it. Why don't we just now make them write it at home for free and then let us read it after it's done? That was the change, was it? Yeah, that became the big spec sale uh, stuff of Shane Black in the early and mid 90s. And nowadays it's even worse where you have to have the finished screenplay, a director and an actor, and then you approach the studio and they'll tell you, OK, we're in or we're out. That's where I'm at right now. I have a, a, a finished action movie with a director that now we have to find an actor for before we can go ask anybody if they're interested. Whereas I told you in the old days, you could say, hey, 
you know, it's die hard in a submarine and boom, you're off to the races. Crazy, crazy stuff. Doesn't work that way anymore. No. So when did you get the first idea for the storyline of Airheads? Because interestingly for me, it was the first film my wife and I saw at the cinema together many, many years ago. Wow. She brought me the soundtrack the following Valentine's Day. <laughs> oh my God. That is, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, that, I, I, I'm trying to remember what the, it's basically, it's, it's a remake of Dog Day Afternoon, plot wise, you know, in a radio station. There is a place in LA called the Musicians Institute of Technology, right? And it's a place where band members go. There's a guitar institute, bass institute, vocal institute, whatever. And I had had a friend who had gone to Vocal Institute of Technology because this was back in the late 80s. It was very hair metal. And he had a class on how to wiggle your ass, you know, seductively. What? I've never heard that before. Yeah. And, and it was so comical that uh, when I moved to L.A., I started going to these clubs and wherever the, the metal scene was dying because you know it was like 1990 and it was it was pretty much over but you could still find these bands desperately flogging the scene out in the valley or wherever and there was something so funny and desperate about it being too late for the wave you know if you were uh, you know there's this band buck cherry you know buck cherry yeah it feels like they were 10 years too late and if they'd come out in the late 80s they'd be you know guns and roses but they didn't they missed their timeline so I felt that way, you know, like here you got these heavy metal guys that have, you know, fucking dreams and ambitions and want to be huge, but the world has already moved on to Nirvana and everything else. All of those people's careers dried up and died, you know, even if you were a big name, it was like, boom, you're out of the, you're out of, you know, Motley Crue was out of business for a decade. So there was something beautiful about that. It's a lost cause, you know, <laughs> you're late to the party with your with your great uh, with your great hairband thing. And that's sort of the, the origin of it. And going around to the places and seeing people still trying to live the rock and roll life on no budget and still have the attitude that they're Steven Tyler from Aerosmith, even though they're, you know, throwing their shit into their own car out in the parking lot of the of the Chili's or whatever. <laughs> it, was, it's, it's, it was right for right for comedy. Was it surreal having your story part of this whole massive project? Isn't the radio station at where they shot Die Hard at Nakatomi Plaza? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That was the parking lot for Fox uh, Studios. In the daytime, it was a parking lot. At night, they would block the entrance with a facade, and it would be the entrance to the radio station. So hanging out there at night when there was hundreds of extras and, and Lemmy and Stuttering John and all of these uh, all these great people, Harold Ramis and Ernie Hudson, that was amazing. How old were you at this time? 27, 28, something like that. And it's kind of mind-blowing because you're, you're like, on the one hand, they're always going to be making a movie. It could be yours. It could be somebody else's, whatever. So, you know, you know they're going to be making a movie. But when they do pick yours, you sort of feel like, wow, I came up with this idea for a radio station and then somebody had to go and design and build it. And they've been doing that for weeks and months. And then every night, da, 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 it's pretty mind blowing. Yeah. And then you come up with some, you know, the, the name of the character and then the name of the character is on a shirt or something, you know, like this stupid shirt I just showed you that says uh, better live than dead. It's like, how fucking random is that? It really, it blows my mind. It's so damn fun. So yeah, to be out there and, and seeing all that shit going on, it was, it was wild. Wonderful, man. And like the cast is incredible. And it's certainly one that's got even more impressive over time when you look at it. For those that don't know or, have, or haven't seen it, you've got Brendan Fraser, Steve Buscemi and Adam Sandler in the lead roles. You've also got Judd Nelson, absolute legend, uh, Michael McKean from Spinal Tap, Harold Ramis and Ernie Hudson from Ghostbusters, like you say, Chris Farley and David Arquette. Wasn't Bill Murray tapped to play the DJ at some point as well? We wanted him to play the DJ. Yeah, that, he would have been a catch. He was very, I think he's even more difficult now but he was difficult back then already and uh, yeah i don't know what his uh I don't even know if he if he read it but I do know that we went after him and maybe we even asked Harold Ramis I don't know I don't quite remember it was a long time ago but yeah th it, that would have been even more legendary but uh yeah I mean you it, with that cast forget about it it was stellar and at the time of release of the film it wasn't considered a success but like over 25 years later it's fallen into i guess cult status when did you first get an indication that that was happening at the 25th anniversary somebody got in touch with me to do an oral history of you know for an article and i was like well why and it's like well no it's got this cult following or whatever and that was the first i'd heard of it so that was like two years ago all i knew was that it was you know it had flopped at the box office 
people had come up to me and said, oh, it was on cable when I was growing up or, you know, it was on TV a lot. Was, and that's awesome. But yeah, to have it have any kind of lasting power, that's that's crazy. Airheads boasts an amazing soundtrack too. Do you recall how the collaboration of Born to Raise Hell came about with getting Lemmy, Ice-T and Whitfield Crane all on one track? Yeah. Originally, the notion that I had was to get, you know, because part of the, the, the movie is about the death of this metal scene or, you know, the music that they represent is on its way out. So initially, what I thought would have been a cool idea was to get bands like Jane's Addiction, Red Hot Chili Peppers and whatever, those kind of bands to do hair metal songs. Wow. Right. So, so you you're sort of getting the Spinal Tap joke of it by getting really cool bands like that to do, give us your best poison. And then they would do that. And um, I was the only one that thought that was a good idea. And they got- Damn it. That is a great idea. (laughs) That would have been so fun. We wanted Flea to be in the movie, but uh, he didn't want to do it because he said it was not his kind of music. And we were like, well, that's the point I want. Anyway, so they got the guy from a magazine called Rip. Yeah, I noticed that, Lon Friend. Yes. So yeah. Long Friend came on board as the music supervisor. And so he started bringing in people. And that's how the, the Whitfield Crane thing came about with Ice-T. But he also was not, he didn't like my idea at all. He, he was very sincerely in love with Aerosmith and whatever. And I love those bands too, but I saw it much more tongue in cheek. That song turned out great. One of my favorites is the Anthrax cover of London on that album. It's fucking great. Yeah, you did get four non-blondes to do a Van Halen song there, though. So that's yeah. kind of... And w- you know what's cool? This is you, you dig this. When you come time to do a movie like this, the bands just submit songs, right? Like they put the call out, who's got something? And so we would get tons of submissions from bands that never saw the light of day. So we'd get a new song by from the Ramones or from whoever, and I'd have them on a little cassette, and I go, "Well, fuck! I'm the only one in the world who has this song of you know whatever it is. I don't, I, I don't have them anymore because I didn't dub them off. But it would be something like Four Non Blondes doing a Van Halen song. There was other Van Halen covers we got from other people. The stuff that fell through the cracks on that on any movie, they you know people want a, their song in a Marvel movie, they gotta send it in there, and then it falls behind somebody's desk. Is there any connection or story about the use of the um, Reagan Youth song, Degenerated? Because the band Degeneration are on your soundtrack, and it's their version, which is the one I'm familiar with. The music supervisors had got this song. I didn't know anything about it until I brought uh, Fat Mike in for a screen. He came into an early screening, Fat Mike from No Effects. And he was like, oh, my God, that's a Reagan Youth song. And I went, no, it's not. That's an original that they did, you know, for the movie. And he said, no, it's a cover song. And that was the first I heard that it was a cover or that the degeneration was a reconstituted version of Reagan Youth. And the, the original song is great. The cover song is great. They did, you know, they went into the studio with Brendan Fraser and the other music supervisor, Leah Volick, who would bring in the musicians. I had worked with her subsequently on another movie, and she brought in Daniel Ray and Richard Hell to play and for Sam Rockwell to sing on this movie, Glory Days. So you get those kind of combo things as well. It's like Fre- Brendan Fraser's in the studio with whoever recording this cover song. That's crazy. We spoke a little about Motley Crue earlier, but um, I want to chat a bit about your involvement with the Dirt movie. Even though you become a punk rock fan, had you stayed aware of Motley Crue over the years? Yeah, but you know, once the once Vince Neil, I don't know if you remember the early '90s history of him, but Vince Neil left for a while. He was chubby and barefoot and trying to do his thing, but he had Steve Stevens on guitar. He was in a very weird place. And then Motley Crue, there was different cycles where they got rid of Vince, then they got rid of Tommy, and they had a girl drummer for a while. And, you know, so there's, you know, New Tattoo and the Karabi one that just called Motley Crue, right? And Generation Swine, all that. And some of them were great, and some of them were not so great. I appreciated them musically. It was the book that got me back into them because it was such an honest reflection. You know, if you have the singer in the band saying, listen, this entire album was shit except for the hit single, that means something to me. Because like having that kind of perspective and go, yeah, okay, you're right. Girls, Girls, Girls is not a great album. It's got a couple of great songs on it. It's not a great album by any means. And to have that honesty was what turned me on because other bands are 
so protective of their legacy. And these guys were actively trying to rip each other apart because they had broken up at the time. And it was just like sniping and fuck you. And that's what made it so great. That's why they tried to pull back on some of that stuff once they got back together. Right. Did you seek out writing the screenplay or did someone approach you? Because that originally began in like 2002, right? That's right. With David Fincher yeah, at the helm. I wrote it in, uh, I, I got the job in 2002. I wasn't allowed to start writing for over a year because as soon as I got hired, the band got into a fight and were suing each other. So I couldn't begin for a year and a half until they ironed that out. Then I banged out a draft on my own and that's the draft that got Fincher interested. So uh, I had one breakfast meeting with him and it was the most brilliant idea in the world, which was to do two versions of the movie, the R-rated and the NC-17 version. NC-17 is, you know, close to X-rated, right? It's worse than, it's the, un, the you know, the, what do they call it? The unrated version they put on DVD. So you can't advertise that in the newspaper, which was how you had to advertise back then. So the idea was we'll have the NC-17 and the R-rated. We'll play both in your town. You can either go see the R-rated one or you can find the theater that's showing the NC-17 one that has the raunchier cut. And everyone was into it. It was like, this was going to be a bold fucking cool ass move. And it was going to be very much like Fight Club you know, with uh, with more nudity and strippers and, and what have you. It was really going to be chaotic. Uh, and the deal fell apart for God knows what reason. It drives me crazy. But that experience, you know, getting to know the guys on Motley Crue, getting to know Fincher, getting to know whatever, your career is marked by the things that don't get made as much as it is by the ones that do. And it's the near misses that just, you know, everyone has. So-and-so was attached. And then if I, I wrote The Green Hornet, in 1997, that was going to be George Clooney starring with Robert Rodriguez directing right after they did the vampire movie with Tarantino. And then that blew up. This uh, Fincher thing blew up the dirt. Larry Charles was going to do the dirt. That blew up. It's just, it's endless and, and horrible. All the things that come close. It almost became like this fantasy project that would never see the light of day and eventually took nearly 20 years. I think you said your script is, the final script was about 50% yours. Is there anything significantly different about yours to what made the scream? Was yours just like, you say, raunchier and edgier? Or was you going to go from the angle of, because in the book it shows different points of view from each character. So would you have done different scenes side by side? There's a visual in the book called the machine, the success machine, basically. And he describes it in one chapter and you start on the treadmill here and most bands die on the treadmill. And if you're lucky, you get up to the first set of cogs, second set of cogs, etc. So I had that as a visual element in the film that we would keep revisiting. As they got to the first level, they'd be on the treadmill and blah, 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 blah. So you get up to the top and find out that the top is just a fucking meat grinder. And any way you slice it, you're going to, you're falling off this machine and getting ground up. So that was a big visual element that appealed to Fincher. Nobody else could figure out how to do it. And ultimately everybody wanted to cut it out because I don't know. It just seemed too hard to visualize or something. I don't I don't quite understand why. But to me, that was the core of it. It was the journey that a band makes through the fame machine and what happens to you when you get spit out. That was the structure of the of the movie, the life cycle of a pop music act. And at the end, they get spit out and they climb right back in the machine and they've been doing it ever since. And that's what's impressive about it. Nobody would want to go through this and do it again, but they do. My version was a lot more nihilistic and cynical because I took to heart the things that they said in the book. You know, they really, they fucked each other's wives. They, you know, so there was a little bit of neatening up that happened for the movie because they're still together and making money together. So it's like, how do we end the movie? We can't end the movie with us all saying, go fuck yourself. We have to end the movie with, all right, guys, let's go out and do it again. Yeah. So, which is fine. There's certain things that get changed, you know, from reality to make a good movie. And my version was, they were not supposed to get together at the end. You know what I mean? They were supposed to stay broken up. So if they'd stayed broken up, then my movie would have been the perfect one. But they got back together and it had to change. I think that was one of the things which I didn't like. It, it seemed very rushed at the end. But I guess that's what happens when you're trying to condense such a large career. Oh, God. I think, yeah, I think at this point it would have probably, if it was happening now, it would be a 10 episode show or mini series or whatever. During the downtime and all the behind the scenes drama with the production of the day, you began working on Punk Like Me. I'm pretty sure you're 
more well-versed on a pitch of the film than I am and can do a much better condensed version. So could you give the listeners an idea of what it's about? Because I think it's one of the most original and fun band documentaries I've seen. I love it. Oh, cool. Well, thank you. It's a documentary about a group of guys who lie their way onto the Warp Tour by saying that they are going to write about it for Rolling Stone magazine. And that's a lie because they don't know anybody at Rolling Stone magazine, but they get the spot on the tour and go on tour anyway. I'm the guy who lied to Rolling Stone. I get the opportunity to go. But then my wife says, hey, wait a minute. I didn't think you were really going to be able to pull this off. I'm not going to let you go. You got to bring me along to be your tour manager. And I say, okay, fine. And then she says, well, what about our 11-month-old daughter? Well, we'll leave her with your parents. Well, I'm going to miss her. So she's got to come. And so do my in-laws. So now it's it's basically about getting your teenage dream of being a rock star and going on the road on the warp Tour, except you're saddled with the baggage of a 37, 38 year old guy, which was wife, kid, in-laws, sort of being, uh, you know, and you wanna be the the 16 year old self who's out there partying all night and you've got all these dumb adult responsibilities to deal with. So it's, it's sort of a, for anybody who wanted to be a rock star and go on tour, it's a great trip because you know, what I realized was I could never live that life in a million years. It would have destroyed me. Anybody who does it is, you know, a different breed of human being. I don't know how anybody survives doing that for years, but this way you get to do it vicariously. You get to see how easily it could rip your life apart and drive you crazy. Uh, it's a wish fulfillment thing. I had the opportunity. I went for it and it came out, you know, the movie's fantastic. It went to South by Southwest. It played at Coachella. We won San Francisco Doc Fest. It streams on Amazon. But the thing is, the band you planned to do the tour with broke up just a few weeks before the first shows, right? <laughs> That's right. Yes, I had, a, I had a band. I was playing drums in that band. A month before that band broke up, And so I was bummed out. I waited two weeks doing nothing. And then I sent out an email to everybody I knew saying, hey, I'm putting together a band. We're going on the Warp Tour in two weeks. Who can make it? So whoever responded, that's how I figured out what the band was going to be. And I found a drummer, but I didn't find a singer. So I became the singer. My friend uh, Don's became the drummer. And I took one guy that I knew from high school, one of my wife's college friends, another guy that I knew from Hollywood, and another friend's younger brother, who we barely knew, stuck them all together. And we, we formed a band. We wrote a half hour's worth of material over the course of a weekend. We rehearsed three times. And then the fourth time we played was on stage in Salt Lake City. So it's like, it's <laughs> for for people that aren't punks, it's the most punk sort of approach to doing a, uh, a tour, completely unprepared, lying your ass off, making it up as you go and just doing it for the, for the, for the fun. And you have an incredible overview on, on how to write a song. Take a melody you like from a popular song, rewrite the lyrics and then present it to your guitar player without chords. And then what you end up with is a completely different, but still kind of familiar song. That's genius. I forgot that. Yeah. It's so good. Oh, I, 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 uh, I, I realize now that you could probably do that for, for movies too, for a movie pitch. <laughs> Just <laughs> think of Dog Day Afternoon, but change the location and then pitch it to producer and let them fill in the rest. You recently said your daughter London has turned 18. She was just a baby in the film as she watched it. Yes. Yeah. We showed it during pandemic. Yes. Because she's in it. She got to be on a tour bus uh, and I, hopefully for the last time in the, sleeping <laughs> in a tour bus. But yes, yeah, she's going off to college in in a week, which wow. is uh, remarkably quick. Yeah. Do you have kids? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do in my life, let alone bring some another human into the world. Um, but it, it, it's a wonderful film, man. And certainly for musicians who are a little older, like myself, <laughs> there's so much to relate to. And I can't wait for some friends of mine to see it. I'm just going yeah. to it to them. I think they'd love it. The band uh, we made up is called Carne Asada. It's a punk rock mariachi band. The concept being like, there's so many bands on this tour. No one's going to know who we are. So we might as well play something different, like mariachi songs. Ay, 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 and La Cucaracha and play them at a punk rock pace. So we did exactly what Sublime does with reggae. We do mariachi songs at a punk rock pace. We do punk rock songs at a mariachi pace. And we just sort of mix uh, uh, English and, and Spanish together uh, with my buddy Luis Lopez on co-vocal singing in Spanish and me in English, you know, wore mariachi outfits cut off into skate shorts. And just it's so ridiculous and fun. The album is everywhere on streaming, Carne Asada, and then the movie is on, uh, on Amazon, Punk Like Me. 
being a screenwriter or just working within the film industry itself, I would imagine you have to develop a pretty thick skin. I think you said you've written nearly 50 scripts and maybe 10 of them have made it to production, which is a really good average. Did you have to get used to something you've devoted so much time in to not making the next stage? Or did you learn that pretty early on and perhaps know that going in? It happened early on. Yeah. Okay. So here's one. It's mid nineties. I wrote a spec script. I had, I had written a movie that I directed called Glory Days that starred Ben Affleck and Sam Rockwell. The follow up to that, I had written a movie and I sent it to my agent and it was about this musician kid who comes to LA to be a rock star, but he doesn't make it a rock star, but he also happens to have a huge dick and he makes it in the porn industry. So I send that to my agent and he's like, I don't know what the fuck to do with this. It's about a kid with a huge dick who becomes a porn guy. And I'm like, well, let's just go out with it. The very next week, there's an announcement. Burt Reynolds has signed up for this movie called Boogie Nights about a musician with a big cock. And that was, it was like, I just spent a year and a half writing this. Who is, how is it possible that two people on planet earth are writing the same fucking story? <laughs> And uh, and the fact that his is a classic, so it's not like I can wait for his to fail and then come out with mine six months later. Uh, so that was my first lesson in the fingers of the universe. It's that what part of the the universal subconscious? It's from Repo Man, where I'll I'll be thinking about a plate of shrimp, and then you'll say shrimp or plate or plate of shrimp, and there's no use looking for an explanation. It's just part of the cosmic unconsciousness. So it was just a coincidence that it was two ideas floating around the same. Yeah, and there's literally scenes that are you know they go my in my movie they go to the drug dealer's house and they have a weird scene like he had with the night ranger song and there's certain things that are like you know weirdly and his was done before mine you know so uh that was my first lesson and yeah getting the carpet yanked out from under you and then it just continues on from there and sometimes you get incredible luck like triple x is a movie that i pitched and then within a year and a half was in theaters that never ever happens I learned subsequently. And then other things will take 17 years to get made. I'm still waiting for my Sam Kinison movie to get made. The producers had the rights for 25 years to the book. I wrote my draft in 2008. We're still trying to find a chubby actor who's bankable as a star <laughs> who wants to try to take on the role of Sam Kinison. And uh, it's based on uh, Sam Kinison's brother's book. Bill Kinnison, and he's uh, involved as executive producer. And I love the script. We've been trying to get it made forever. There's just very few people that fit that role and who actually want to try to take on. I got to say, there's got to be the pressure for that as well, for someone such an iconic guy. Like, do I want the world looking at me, see how I pull it off? Yeah, exactly. It's it's extraordinarily difficult. And he's 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 a controversial kind of guy as well. So you know, there, there's things that are worth waiting for. And that's one that, that David Permit, the producer, has been waiting a quarter century to freaking do since 96, he said the rights. Unreal, man. Unreal. And just in closing, um, there's a clip in Punk Like Me. It's mentioned that you were voted most changed at a high school reunion. Oh, Is yeah. that true? Yeah, yeah. But you say you're still the same. Is there a lot of truth in that? You kind of knew early on what you truly enjoyed. So you kind of stuck to a path of making things that you could put that energy and enthusiasm in. And the result is that people can see that in the projects that you make. You know, all of the people that you admire, whether it's, you know, Tarantino or whoever, they keep their their passion for what they loved when they were young. I mean, you've got Van Halen behind you. You've got the Chucky doll behind you. All of that stuff that went into the machine when you were in, you know, seventh, eighth grade, the bad movies, the comic books, the, you know, the shitty songs, the pops or whatever, all of that is part of your DNA. And I have certain friends that, you know, don't listen to what they used to in high school and other people that do. And for me, tapping into that, those are the times when you're most passionate about pop culture. I have other things that I'm worried about now as an adult, but when you're 16, 17 and the album comes out and it's disappointing, it's like the, these fucking guys have stabbed me in the back. Fuck that band. You have that kind of passion. You have to tap back into that for, you know, working in, in movies and TV and, you know, what does James Gunn do except bring back the trauma movies from his youth, the music from his youth. I mean, and he does it fantastically. It's what makes those things so interesting. People can see that enthusiasm as well, I think. They can tell when it's a passion project. Yeah, when, when uh, you know, I'm, I'm reading the Tarantino book and it's just packed with 
more and more of the stuff you love from Tarantino, the endless dialogue about minutia from pop culture from 1969 or whatever. For some people, it, it works. For some people, it doesn't. I mean, th this approach of sticking with the things that you loved when you were young. I, I don't know if that's a, a Michael Mann thing or a David Simon thing, but there's there's certain people that are more, I guess, pop culture oriented, uh, you know, like uh, the boys TV show and things like that, that are that are very much grounded in, in what the, the creators grew up on. I mean, you know, why would you let go of the stuff that you loved as a kid? And it's weird when you're a kid as well. I don't know if you experience it now, but time does move so much faster. It's like the things which I gravitate to are probably within like a two or three year period, especially with music. I always reference um, Motley Crue, Decade of Decadence. So much happened in that first 10 years. Yeah, exactly. And now 10 years just goes just like that. It's unreal. They went through so many changes within that 10 year period. Everything was different each time. But now 10 years can go by between albums. It's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. I do remember when that album came out thinking like, wow, God, that's I can't believe leave it 10 whole years uh yeah and now it's like they could have done what well, they could now do a 41 years of decadence yeah crazy rich thank you ever so much mate i love chatting with you um i appreciate all the stories there's so much more i could go in but i just wanted to condense a few uh, little bits which i think people will enjoy i appreciate it Rob. this has been a, a lot of fun i like talking about this kind of stuff anytime i would uh you know when i have something new i'd love to come back and yell at you about it first we rock it then we kick it then we play it real fast till I'm pissed without a rash And we roll it, we control it And you'll never suspect we're all college graduates Cause wouldn't it make you sick to understand We're not a real band We're not a real band I don't know what to say so I'll say it anyway It's the truth but the truth is you can't handle the truth No! We're not a real band want to send a big thank you shout out to rich wilkes for being so cool and chatting with me here on the straight to video podcast such a great journey he continues to be on and awesome to see how much love he still has for both movies and music which made it a joy to chat about i hope you enjoyed it too and we'll spend some time to check out punk like me on amazon prime please let me know what you think if you get a chance to watch or maybe give rich a shout on instagram at rich underscore k underscore wilkes and i'm sure he'd love to hear from you that's all for this episode. You can check out over 100 more shows at stvpod.com or drop by the Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash stvpod. All the messages, comments, listens and shares are simply massive and really mean a lot. But until we chat again, please look after yourselves and speak to you real soon. <laughs>